Welcome to chapter 23 and things fall apart. Uh, you recall at the end of chapter 22, the Agu destroyed the, um, the church that Mr. Smith had, uh, excuse me, that Mr. Brown had built, that Mr. Smith is now running. Um, so they're starting to take some action toward these Christians. Let's see if this chapter advances those developments. Here we go with chapter 23. For the first time in many years, Akanko had a feeling that was akin to happiness. The times which had altered so unaccountably during his exile seemed to be coming round again. The clan which had turned false on him appeared to be making amends. He had spoken violently to his clansmen when they had met in the marketplace to decide on their action, and they had listened to him with respect. It was like the good old days again when a warrior was a warrior. Although they had not agreed to kill the missionary or drive away the Christians, they had agreed to do something substantial, and they had done it. Aconqua was almost happy again. For two days after the destruction of the church, nothing happened. Every man in Umuafia went about armed with a gun or a machete. They would not be caught unawares like the men of Abame. Then the district commissioner returned from his tour. Mr. Smith went immediately to him, and they had a long discussion. The men of Umuafia did not take any notice of this, and if they did, they thought it was not important. The missionary often went to see his brother, White Man. There was nothing strange in that. Three days later, the district commissioner sent a sweet-tongued messenger to the leaders of Umuafia, asking them to meet him in his headquarters. That also was not strange. He often asked them to hold such palavers, as he called them. Akonkwo was among the six leaders he invited. Akonkwo warned the others to be fully armed. An Umuafia man does not refuse a call, he said. He may refuse to do what he is asked. He does not refuse to be asked. But the times have changed, and we must be fully prepared. And so the six men went to see the district commissioner, armed with their machetes. They did not carry guns, for that would be unseemly. So they're like, well, if we carry guns, that may look too aggressive. But if we just put our machetes on, then we'll be fine. They were led into the courthouse where the district commissioner sat. He received them politely. They unslung their goatskin bags and their sheathed machetes, put them on the floor, and sat down. I have asked you to come, began the commissioner, because of what happened during my absence. I have been told a few things, but I cannot believe them until I have heard your own side. Let us talk about it like friends, and find a way of ensuring that it does not happen again. Agwefe Akweme rose to his feet and began to tell the story. Wait a minute, said the commissioner. I want to bring in my men so that they too can hear of your grievances and take warning. Many of them come from distant places, and although they speak your tongue, they are ignorant of your customs. James, go and bring in the men. His interpreter left the courtroom and soon returned with twelve men. They sat together with the men of Umuafia and Aguefe Ekweme began to tell the story of how Enoch murdered an Ekwugwu. It happened so quickly that the six men did not see it coming. There was only a brief scuffle, too brief even to allow the drawing of a sheathed machete. The six men were handcuffed and led into the guard room. We shall not do you any harm, said the district commissioner to them later, if only you agree to cooperate with us. We have brought a peaceful administration to you and your people so that you may be happy. If any man ill treats you, we shall come to your rescue, but we will not allow you to ill treat others. We have a court of law where we judge cases and administer justice, just as it is done in my own country under a great queen. I have brought you here because you joined together to molest others, to burn people's houses in their place of worship. That must not happen in the dominion of our queen, the most powerful ruler in the world. I have decided that you will pay a fine of 200 bags of calories. You will be released as soon as you agree to this and undertake to collect that fine from your people. What do you say to that? So we have a lot of stuff that just happened here in the district commissioner's speech. The first thing I want to point out is the irony. He says, we've brought a peaceful administration. Peaceful to who, though? It's certainly not peaceful to the Igbo, because the Igbo continue to do things in their old way, and when they do, if it violates the law of the white man, who these Igbo people are ignorant of his laws, then they punish these Igbo people. And in some cases, they even hang them. 
which is not peaceful at all. So that's a, that's a serious issue. And then he says, if any man ill treats you, we're going to come to your rescue. Well, what is he doing to these people? They handcuffed them. All they were doing was trying to tell their side of the story. So they're definitely being ill treated. So the district commissioner um, doesn't understand or he's being facetious. And then we have nationalism. Nationalism is where basically you think your country is better than all other countries in the world. And we can see that in a couple of places in the district commissioner's speech. He talks about they have a great queen. He talks about how she's the most powerful ruler in the world. And then we also have imperialism, where he says that this, meaning the place that they're in now in Nigeria, is the dominion of the queen, meaning that, hey, we stuck our flag down here and now we own this land that you thought you owned. So, a lot of stuff just happened in that speech. The six men remained sullen and silent, and the commissioner left them for a while. He told the court messengers when he left the guardroom to treat the men with respect because they were the leaders of Umuafia. They said, yes, sir, and saluted. As soon as the district commissioner left, the head messenger, who was also the prisoner's barber, took down his razor and shaved off all the hair on the men's heads. They were still handcuffed, and they just sat and moped. So now they've shaved these guys' heads. And that's a way to, like, embarrass them and to start winning over this psychological battle against these men. That's a way to say, ha, we're in control. We're even in so much control that we're going to shave your heads and leave you bald. Who is chief among you? The court messengers asked in jest. We see that every pauper wears the anklet of title in Umuafia. Does it cost as much as ten calories? So now they're making fun of these guys. They've shaved their heads. Now they're teasing them. The six men ate nothing throughout that day and the next. They were not even given any water to drink. And they could not go out to urinate or go into the bush when they were pressed. At night the messengers came in to taunt them and to knock their shaven heads together. Even when the men were left alone, they found no words to speak to one another. It was only on the third day when they could no longer bear the hunger and the insults that they began to talk about giving in. We should have killed the white man if you had listened to me, a Akonko snarled. We could have been in Umuru now waiting to be hanged, someone said to him. Who wants to kill the white man, asked a messenger who had just rushed in. Nobody spoke. You are not satisfied with your crime, but you must kill the white man on top of it. He carried a strong stick and he hit each man a few blows on the head and back. A Akonko was choked with hate. As soon as the six men were locked up, court messengers went into Umuafia to tell the people that their leaders would not be released unless they paid a fine of 250 bags of calories. Remember what the district commissioner said. He says the fine is 200 bags of calories. Now that his uh, henchmen, so to speak, have gone into Umuafia, they've raised the price to 250 bags. So that's showing you corruption now uh, within the system. Unless you pay the fine immediately, said their head man, we will take your leaders to Umuru before the big white man and hang them. This story spread quickly through the villages and was added to as it went. Some said that the men had already been taken to Umuru and would be hanged on the following day. Some said that their families would also be hanged. Others said that the soldiers were already on their way to shoot the people of Umuafi as they had done in Abame. It was the time of the full moon. But that night the voice of children was not heard. The village Elo, where they always gathered for a moon play, was empty. The women of Igwedu did not meet in their secret enclosure to learn a new dance to be displayed later to the village. Young men who were always abroad in the moonlight kept their huts that night. Their manly voices were not heard on the village paths as they went to visit their friends and lovers. Umuafia was like a startled animal with ears erect, sniffing the silent, ominous air, and not knowing which way to run. The silence was broken by the village crier, beating his sonorous ojene. He called every man in Umuafia, from the Akakanma age group upwards, to a meeting at the marketplace after the morning meal. He went from one end of the village to the other and walked all its breadth. He did not leave out any of the main footpaths. Akonkwa's compound was like a deserted homestead. It was as if cold water had been poured on it. 
His family was all there, but everyone spoke in whispers. His daughter, Azinma, had broken her 28-day visit to the family of her future husband and returned home when she heard that her father had been imprisoned and was going to be hanged. As soon as she got home, she went to Obierica to ask what the men of Umuafia were going to do about it. But Obierica had not been home since morning. His wives thought he had gone to a secret meeting. Azinma was satisfied that something was being done. On the morning after the village crier's appeal, the men of Umuafia met in the marketplace and decided to collect, without delay, 250 bags of calories to appease the white man. They did not know that 50 bags would go to the court messengers who had increased the fine for that purpose. So that's it for chapter 23. You'll start to see that things are falling apart here, um, and Aconquo is currently in some serious hot water. So we're, we're going to get into chapter 24 the next time.